I gather I am to blame for all of the uh, problems that uh, uh, the language creates, because the language does create, it is very important in this uh, relationship. And uh, it's, uh, it is about potentially to cause another problem as we go through the transition that uh, Evan just, uh, just referred to. Let, let me, st I, don't, I don't have a formal set of remarks, so I'm gonna talk at you a bit. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that this election that Evan referred to is really a very impressive demonstration of democracy in Taiwan. Uh, it was robust. It did not have nearly the degree of uh, charged corruption that has uh, been around during previous elections. Uh, and it resulted in the, the, uh, the one party seizure of government, if you will, that, that Evan referred to. At the same time, I would resist the notion, not that you suggested it, but a lot of people have suggested that this is sort of a revolution in the political structure in Taiwan. We'll have to see. A lot of this came out of the so-called sunflower movement from uh, a year ago, a year ago, yes, uh, in March, in April, and um, the kind of activism, particularly of young people, uh, that that resulted in the uh, feeling only intensified that the Mainzhou administration uh, was out of touch and out of control. Uh, that is not, not wild, but it was not in charge of what was going on uh, in, in the economy. And increasingly, a sense that the Ma administration was leaning too far in the direction of uh, the mainland in the negotiations that were uh, taking place at the time. So uh, it was also true that the KMT, the, the Kuomintang Nationalist Party, had suffered a major defeat in November of 2014 in local elections. Uh, they, the, the DPP, uh, the Taiwan's party, took over 13 uh, out of 22 major cities and counties, all but one major city, uh, and that one, the uh, KMT controlled by, by a hair. Uh, and so they were in disarray. They were, demo they were uh, demoralized. Uh, they didn't seem to be able to get their act together in much of any way. Uh, and meanwhile, the DPP, having lost badly in earlier years, did a lot of very good groundwork uh, in terms of putting together local organizations uh, and organizing for this election. And it became pretty clear uh, as the last year has gone by that Tsai was going to win the presidency. Uh, so they then began to focus on the legislature. Uh, and they actually had a hope that maybe the DPP plus its allies would win 64 out of 113 seats. They alone, the DPP, won 68 seats. I mean, this was a very dramatic uh, change. Now, I would argue to you that's not necessarily, first of all, in terms of the DPP, unified government. There are different views in the DPP, and one reason why Tsai Ing-wen, against some advice, has stayed as chairperson of the DPP is to maintain some control. So her former, when she ran last time, her vice presidential Running mate is now the speaker of the legislature. Uh, and so hopefully she will have an in that way in trying to control what happens uh, in the legislature. There are some other people who she doesn't have as close a relationship with within her own party. And so we'll have to see how that works out. But my point is that the DPP, some people think, is, is now poised to control politics in Taiwan for a very long time. And that may be true, uh, but including what I want to talk about in terms of cross-strait relations and how that might work out for her, that also may not be true. Tsai faces some very serious problems with the economy, uh, with social welfare issues, uh, with law. I mean, she's, she's got a huge agenda in front of her, and the relationship with the mainland will affect a lot of, of that. The election campaign, uh, Tsai tried to focus largely 
on domestic issues because that's where I think she felt and the DPP felt they had their advantage. Uh, they had new ideas. They were closer to the people. Mind Joe was seen as aloof, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, uh, the election, I believe, was importantly conditioned by cross-strait relations. So I campaigned on the notion of maintaining the status quo in cross-strait relations, status quo of peace and stability. Now, for the DPP, which has a history of being viewed as a, quote, pro-independence party, uh, there was a lot of uh, doubt about that uh, in, in various quarters, including in the mainland. The mainland basically, number one, doesn't trust Tsai personally. They look at her personal history with previous administrations, going back to Li Dong Hui, who was KMT, but is very pro-independence. Uh, Chen Shui Bian from 2000 to 2008, who was always seeking to push the envelope on the question of independence, not because I, I believe he was, thought he could get independence, but because he wanted to push the envelope. Uh, and there are various things they did that are, if you will, credited to Tsai. And the mainland looks at her and they say, she's a real ideologue. And she may talk a good game about maintaining the status quo, but in fact, uh, she's going to talk one way when she's a candidate. When she's in office, she's going to act another way. And besides, what is the status quo? For Tsai, she's saying the status quo is peace and stability. It's also that Taiwan is not part of the PRC. It's also that she does not accept that there is one China which has been a mainstay of the Ma Ying-jeou administration's relationship uh, across the strait. Uh, and the mainland has said, I'm sorry, that's not our status quo. The status quo is that there is one China, and it's, we call it the 92 consensus, but you can call it whatever you want. The essence is there is one China of which Taiwan and the mainland are both a part. And if you don't accept that, you're not accepting the status quo. You're not maintaining the status quo. You're changing things. We, the mainland, are very consistent. Our position is we've been able to have 23 agreements with the Ma administration over the last eight years because he agreed there was one China. Not entirely the same thing as the mainland's one China, but nonetheless, one China. If you, Tsai one or you, the DPP, don't accept that, then the foundation of what we've been doing disappears. It's not that we're going to be punishing you. Please, please, don't, don't, don't think that. But we have relationships of various sorts, institutional relationships, uh, between so-called white glove organizations, which do the negotiation of these 23 agreements and their implementation. Now, between the two cabinet offices that supervise the policy uh, and their leaders have met. That's, that's pretty authoritative, even though uh, nobody accepts that the uh, uh, other side uh, has, has sovereignty. There are a bunch of things that will disappear potentially if there is not an agreed foundation, as far as the mainland is concerned, based on acceptance of one China. So what Tsai has tried to do over the last year, mainly since about April, instead of doing what she had done before, which is to not deny the 92 consensus, it doesn't exist, it has no validity, rejecting it, she has stopped, she stopped talking about that. She stopped talking about Taiwan's sovereignty, although she did talk about maintaining the sovereignty of the people in terms of their ability to determine their own future. She stopped using buzzwords, which were clearly going to uh, upset the PRC. And instead, she talked, as I say, about maintaining peace and stability. She talked about being consistent, predictable, and sustainable in her relationship with the mainland. She changed her vocabulary about the mainland. Part of the thing that the PRC looks at, these words that Evan talked about, does the DPP talk about China and Taiwan, as though they are two separate countries, or does it use language which uh, at least potentially includes them in one country? And increasingly, Tsai and the DPP have talked about cross-strait relations, which is pretty neutral. Uh, they still talk about China and Taiwan to some extent, right? But they also talk about mainland China, which is what Ma talks about, talk about cross-strait relations. So anyway, the words have also shifted to some extent to try to avoid uh, provoking problems. Uh, Tsai has said that 
she would govern in accordance with the will of the people and the existing Republic of China constitutional order. Now, the Republic of China constitutional order, instinctively in most people's minds, is a one China constitutional order. But in fact, there have been times when the DPP has defined the Republic of China as consisting only of Taiwan, the Penghu Islands in the middle of the Taiwan Strait, Jinmen, and Mazu. So the PRC asks the question, what constitutional order are you talking about? And why don't you talk about the Constitution? What is this constitutional order bit? Right? Tsai has a response, which is that uh, it include, what, what does it include? It includes the provisions of the Constitution. It includes subsequent amendments, and there have been a lot of those, interpretations, court decisions, and practices uh, by government and different sectors of the population. I mean, you know, if, if you were sitting in the mainland and you, you listened to this, it would seem like you've sort of got a, a large hole through which you could drive uh, a Mack truck. She summarized her view on this at uh, a speech in Washington last June by saying anything that is related to the Constitution, the interpretation, and the practices are part of the constitutional order. Okay, so this in a sense was a step forward and it was combined with something else, which is that she said that she would basically base her policy on the cum accumulated outcomes of the more than 20 years, more than 20 years of negotiations and exchanges. Well, more than 20 years sort of takes you back to 1992. Is she accepting the 92 consensus? Certainly not by name. What is she trying to do? She's trying to say, in my view, to the United States, to the PRC, and to others, I'm not going to act in a manner inconsistent with what's going on. I'm not going to reject what has been achieved. At one point, she, she opposed uh, a basic economic framework agreement that was negotiated with the mainland. None of that. They're not going to overthrow that. They're not going to amend those things. So she is now, I think, basically seeking to demonstrate that she is a positive force, but she will not accept one China in an open, direct way. And she will not do the other thing which the mainland has asked for, which is oppose Taiwan independence. She's not going to promote Taiwan independence. There's no possibility of promoting Taiwan independence, but she's not going to oppose it. She also has sought, as I mentioned, to sort of please the United States in part of this, which is to, uh, the U.S. has called in various speeches for both sides, both sides, establishing a firm basis for continuing the peace and stability that has existed now for the last eight years. And she used that term in her speech uh, in Washington. So she's trying to make a pitch to everybody, give me a chance, I'm not going to uh, be a problem. No surprises, no provocations. Uh, I am going to uh, be a steady force. She also said that a leader, a national leader, must transcend political party. So what's that mean? That means that she is not going to be bound in some rigid way by DPP ideology. And if you go back into the DPP history, you will find various resolutions that refer to Taiwan as an independent country. 1991, part of the par party charter is what they call the Taiwan Independence Plank. It calls for a referendum or a plebiscite to establish a Republic of Taiwan. 1999, they passed another resolution which basically said, we don't need that, we're already independent, we're called the Republic of China, but we're independent, we're separate from the PRC, and if you want to overturn that, you need to have a plebiscite to overturn that. But that still, frankly, is a Taiwan independence provision. And in 2007, as if they were a little nervous about, some people were nervous, they passed another resolution which reaffirmed uh, the need to go back and do all these things that were talked about in the previous resolutions. The PRC, as I say, has throughout stressed the importance of the 1992 consensus. Now, the 1992 consensus was never a document or a single piece of paper or anything that actually had something that the two sides you could pin themselves to. I believe there was a consensus, however. In 1992, authorities from both sides met in Hong Kong 
and then they had exchanges of cables. And what they agreed to at that time was that there is one China. And they also agreed to something else, which they don't talk about much these days, which is that the goal is unification. Now, obviously, that remains the PRC goal. Uh, that is not a goal that anybody in Taiwan would be uh, actively promoting today. Uh, but that there is one China. The name 92 consensus was created uh, by a fellow named Su Qi, who was in, actually was in the Li Donghui administration. And as Chen Shui Bin was coming in, in order to somehow find a term that would be acceptable, he created this term. Interestingly, the PRC at first resisted the term, and now they're wedded to it. You know, they practically uh, welded their, their bodies to this, firm, this term. Uh, they say the core of this 1992 consensus is that Taiwan and the mainland both belong to one and the same China. Okay? So they worry that even if Tsai Ing-wen says, and I'll get to a point where she has talked a little bit more about the 92 consensus, says, yeah, yeah, there's a historical fact. They met in 1992, uh, and they agreed to uh, seek common ground and set aside differences. That's a process issue. That's not accepting the historical fact that the 1992 consensus was an agreement that there is one China to which both sides of the strait belong. And so far, she's, she's been unwilling to really um, do that. So have, she, she also had an interview, by the way, with the Liberty Times, a uh, very pro-DPP uh, newspaper uh, in January, in which she advanced some of the language which she had used last year in Washington in her speech. Uh, and the government, it, it would seem that the other side kind of expected what she was going to say, and they didn't directly criticize her, but others in the PRC system did. One very important academic said this was a, a mini-step yeah, it was a step forward, but it was a mini step forward, and she was ev evading the core issue, which is, is there one China to which the two sides belong or not? If she doesn't accept this, even with what she said in Washington, even what we, with what she said in the Liberty Times uh, interview, if she doesn't affirmatively embrace one China, what's going to happen? There was a time, and I wrote about this, Evan mentioned other writing I do. I write for a, an online publication called the China Leadership Monitor uh, and try to keep up with what's going on uh, over the course of the preceding period. Um, and, and I talked about this. There was a time where it seemed to me there was a potential nuance in the PRC position. That is, if she just didn't negate the 92 consensus or the idea of one China, didn't have to embrace it, if she just didn't negate it, then maybe they could find a way to sort of slide along for a while. On the other hand, of course, if she promoted Taiwan independence, forget about it, then we're in a whole other world. She's not going to do that. But it seems to me that over time, in fact, the PRC position, if there was a nuance, has tightened up again. And Xi Jinping personally has talked about the importance uh, of embracing the 92 consensus or some kind of one China. I mean, one of the issues is, as, as a lot of people in the mainland will say, look, the 92 consensus, that phrase was invented by Su Qi, who is a KMP guy. So there's no way that the DPP is going to accept it, right? We don't care. Now, Xi Jinping hasn't said that, but but in essence, that's the, that's the view. They don't care. They care about one China. So you can call it whatever you want to call it, as long as it's got a core of one China to which Taiwan and the mainland both belong, that's going to be good enough for government work. Uh, if she doesn't actively embrace it, what are the consequences likely to be? The hints are, sometimes a little more than hint, they will cut off the exchange, exchanges between these two organizations that do the negotiations. So there will be no more negotiations. They will cut off the cabinet level agent, uh, agent uh, uh, cabinet level uh, meetings and communications. One thing about that is they just recently created a hotline. Where is it? It's in those two cabinet level agencies. 
uh, they will probably steal some of Taiwan's diplomatic partners. There was what Mind Zhou called a diplomatic truce, which was basically a non-agreed agreement to let Taiwan keep its, at the time, 23, now 22 diplomatic partners, and PRC wouldn't steal them, even though a number of them went to Beijing and said, hey, you know, we really like to sort of switch sides here. And Beijing said, it's, it's not convenient to do that. Uh, it may become convenient. And a signal of that was that the one country that went, changed it from 23 to 22 was the Gambia, which broke relations a couple of years ago with Taiwan. Beijing still held them off. But just recently, in the last couple of weeks, they suddenly established relations with the Gambia. Beijing did. Well, of course, the explanation is this, in, when, I, when I was in Beijing, I was not only in Taiwan. This has nothing to do with Taiwan. Why would you think that? How could you possibly think this was a signal that this might be something coming down the road if Tsai doesn't accept one China? Uh, clearly a signal. Uh, they didn't steal a partner, okay? Gambia had already broken relations. But it's a pretty clear uh, indication of what, what might be coming. So there are a lot of consequences that could come out of a refusal of Bai Tsai to embrace one China, and she will not embrace one China, in my view. She may go a little further than she's gone. We'll have to see. Uh, indications from her were she doesn't really have much more she can do. She can do a little more, maybe, but not much more. However, the PRC also wants to maintain what they call their policy of peaceful development of cross-strait relations. So what is that going to mean in this situation where all these linkages are being broken? That means the private sector. That means working to promote relations with younger people. They have a big problem with young people who do not identify with the mainland at all and who are very much opposed to unification. Everybody in Taiwan, if you take a poll, and people have done this in Taiwan, you know, what's your view on reunification? 70 to 80 percent of the people are opposed. Not neutral, not, eh, we don't care, opposed, okay? If you give them a choice about maintaining the status quo or moving to independence or moving to unification, status quo gets over 80 percent because people don't want to take a chance. But if you force them to, ask, to answer the question, do you want reunification, the answer is a resounding no, they don't. So they want to maintain, mainly wants to maintain, I think, economic relations. They want to reach out to the youth. Uh, they want to have all sorts of informal ties. What they did in the Chen Shui Bian era, which was interesting, was they had industry associations meet. But in, few, in these industry association meetings were officials from both sides who did the real negotiation. I've been told by people in the mainland we're not going to do that again. I don't know if that's true, not true. But that is sort of a stated position. One of the other things, by the way, that is likely to be a consequence is that the mainland will block Taiwan, as they seem already to be doing, from negotiating bilateral, essentially free trade agreements with other countries. We have instances where that's pretty clear already. Taiwan wants to join the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, if there ever, ever is a Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, well, one thing is that the mainland would likely want to be in it first, as they were in the World Trade Organization. But even if that were not an obstacle, if political relations across the strait are not in good shape, it seems to me that Beijing is not going to be tolerant of Taiwan joining an international organization, even though they're qualified. They're an APEC member, which is the basic qualification. And they need to reform their economy, which they can do. But Beijing will not want to let that happen. And my view is there are 12 original partners. And I don't know what the rules will be for the next round of uh, applicants. But I'm sure there will be an opportunity for Beijing to lean on some of those 12 to say, again, it's, it's really not convenient uh, to have Taiwan in, in uh, the TPP. Taiwan has been allowed to have an observer at the World Health or, uh, Assembly. Uh, that may actually happen again this year, even though the assembly begins after Tsai Ing-wen will have been inaugurated. But they've got lots of time, right? They can, next year, they've got the International Civil Aviation Organization, which Taiwan was allowed to send a guest to uh, three years ago. Uh, probably not this time, if you've still got a political problem. 
Uh, there are all sorts of international organizations, and it's not only governmental organizations. It's NGO organizations, which is really irritating to people in Taiwan. What's it got? You, know, you guys have a problem at your level. Why can't I go? I'm, I've been the Taiwan uh, Floral Association for the last 70 years. Why can't I use that title if I go to a meeting? Well, as one foreign minister explained it to me, or I guess he was then, this is the current foreign minister, the former Taiwan Affairs Office head, they don't want any impression of one China, one Taiwan, or two Chinas out there. So they insist on changing titles. But it isn't only titles. It's also making life difficult for the delegations when they show up. So we'll have to see uh, what the consequences uh, will be. Uh, Senior people in Beijing say we're depending on the people in Taiwan, that they will come to recognize that their economic interest, their cultural affiliation, uh, their identity as a ch part of a Chinese nation. And this is true. When you talk about a Chinese nation, those of you who speak Chinese, Zhonghua Minzu, support is very high in Taiwan. 70 to 80% of the people agree. You want to talk about being Chinese and the Zhongguan, that, that's a different story. But Chung Hwa Minzu, they, they will accept. So what they're saying is the reality of the mainland, its economic weight, its cultural force, and its military force will cause people in Taiwan to face reality. And so that will either put pressure on Tsai Ing-wen to change her policy, or it will lead in four years, presumably, this is not said, but this is presumed, in my, at least on my part, to a, lead to a, call, a change in government. Two more comments on that. One is, with the Guomindang in such rotten shape, the question is, OK, so they create a situation in which Tsai, in many respects, fails, because she will depend on the mainland for economic success, and, she, and so on. Uh, is the Guomindang going to be ready to take over power again? And that's an open question right now. The other thing is the United States view. And the United States has been pressing very hard for a long time to have both sides be flexible, creative, uh, and restrained. And yet we see things moving in a direction where I don't think there's going to be a crisis. We're not in a Taiwan independence issue, but where we could have problems. And frankly, I don't know how the US is going to respond to that. Uh, it will obviously urge both sides to find a way forward. Uh, but if two, the both sides don't find a way forward, uh, then what will we do? And maybe that's a question that uh, Evan will have a, uh, an answer to. Why don't I just stop here, if I might, take whatever questions you've got. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, use the mic for me as well as your fellows. Uh, what, in your opinion, then, would be the ideal position of the Taiwan government in terms of U.S. interests. That is, you just mentioned uh, Washington uh, foresees or suspects that there will be untoward consequences, possibly. Look, my, let me start out by saying some people think it would be just a nifty idea to bring Taiwan into the U.S security architecture in Asia. I think that would be a disaster. It would prove to Beijing that we really do want to use Taiwan to contain the mainland, and so on. Uh, maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait through a variety of ways, including sufficient self-defense capabilities, but also a smooth political and economic relationship, I think is mainly what we're going for. So the US interest, I would say, could be sort of summarized, at least as I'm thinking about it at the moment, in two ways. One is preserving the democracy that they've got, helping protect it, political development as well as economic development. But the other is to maintain peace and stability in the Strait. I mean, that is basically a vital national interest of the United States. Because if there is not peace and stability in the Strait, the chance of being drawn into conflict with the mainland is not small. Now, I don't think we're heading there. Right? If, if Tsai Ing-wen... Or, or somebody else at this point, were like Chen Shui-bian. And even though, as I say, I don't think he thought he could get independence, but he kept provoking and doing things. If we were in that kind of a situation, I think it would be much more dangerous. 
You know, at the end of the Chen Shui Bian era, the mainland talked about a period of high danger. They're not talking about that. I don't think anybody in a responsible position in the mainland thinks Tsai is going to push for Taiwan independence. They're much more worried about the evolution of society and how a Tsai administration will affect that. Uh, they look at identity. And even under Mying Zhou, if you look at charts, the Taiwanese-only identity has gone up significantly to about 60-plus percent. Taiwanese and, and, and Chinese identity, which together has gone down from 40 to, I guess, around 30-something percent. They're worried about that trend. And that is a much stronger trend among young people than it is among the population at large. So they worry about that. They worry about the education system, which is going to teach Taiwan as a separate subject from China. Okay? That, that, so it's that kind of thing that they worry about and which they could put, try to put some pressure on. From the United States' point of view, basically how they work that out is up to them. Our interest, as I say, is preserving Taiwan's political and economic development and peace and stability in the Strait. And of course, we have a major interest in maintaining stable relations and productive relations with the PRC. So, not easy. You know, what's ideal? Making all that work. How do you do that when you've got a president-elect about to take office who will not do what Beijing wants her to do, uh, and Beijing insists that either she do it or there will be consequences? I'm not sure. What is the influence now of Taiwan as an example of how a ruling party can gracefully cede power and liberal democracy can flourish um, in uh, China? And does this, is this something that the Xi Jinping regime, given its uh, ambition to establish a more autocratic system, uh, mean that uh, Xi Jinping is going to want to change the status quo in the same way that uh, the Beijing regime has uh, changed the status quo uh, with respect to Hong Kong, sort of in order to prove they can do it, if nothing else. Change the status quo? Uh, to, well, toward... Um, on the mainland or uh, in Taiwan? Or? Well, uh, that uh, the Beijing regime has uh, uh, been seeking to marginalize in Hong Kong. Yeah, but what, so, when you say that he would, as, as in Hong Kong, he would seek to change the status quo, what are you talking about, on the mainland or in Taiwan? Well, seeing uh, Taiwan um, as Taiwan's, um, uh, Taiwan's definition of the status quo okay. as a threat. And, and the example, simply the example of Taiwan yeah. as a liberal democracy as a threat. I mean, obviously, uh, at least obviously to me, and also may have a different view. Uh, Xi Jinping is not interested in that particular model. There are people who are and who study Taiwan. Now, the Taiwan de democratic model has a few drawbacks, such as uh, the legislative UN, the legislature, can get very raucous and they can throw inkwells at one another and occupy the podium and do all sorts of things. It's not 100% attractive in that respect. But the basic system, and this time in the elections, it was a very uh, exemplary, I would argue, uh, demonstration of democracy at work. So I think that, again, the academics who think about the long-term future in the mainland will think about that. But Hong Kong is in a different situation. Right? I think the mainland has messed up in Hong Kong pretty badly. Uh, I think they could have handled Hong Kong a lot better, and who knows in the future maybe they will. But they have basically sort of said, you know, one country, two systems. And you know what comes first. It's not two systems, Charlie. Uh, and and they, they did this in public documents, and they did this in the way, very heavy-handedly. Uh, but, but Hong Kong's part of China. And, and Taiwan is whatever you want to describe it. It is not part of the PRC. Hong Kong is part of the PRC. So I don't think that uh, the status quo I'm talking about about one China is a bit different. Uh, but in terms of democratic practice, uh, I don't think the mainland, I don't think it loves what's going on. In, it certainly doesn't love the result of what's going on in Taiwan. Uh, 
but and they're certainly not looking to it. This government, this this regime in, in Beijing is not looking to it as a model, uh, but it doesn't have the same tools at all. It's a very different situation, I would argue, from Hong Kong. I don't know if that's responsive to your question, but. Actually, I was trying to get more at, uh... at whether the Beijing would, regime would see the status quo as a threat and therefore seek to uh, put, apply more leverage. Uh, to status quo in what sense? I'm not understanding. Well, the, the peace and the peace and Across stability. the strait, the status quo yes, across the yes. strait. I mean, sure, they, they define the status quo differently, however. They define it as accepting one China. That's where we've been, Dr. Tsai. If you don't accept that, you're breaking the status quo. We're not breaking the status quo. So they are arguing, they are consistent. They have been, uh, they're not raising the bar. The situation has changed over the last eight years. And they're saying, if you want to continue to have the kind of relationships we've had for the last eight years, with a lot of agreements, a lot of travel and trade and all the rest of it, and the, and the official agreements on all sorts of things, prisoner exchange, judicial, I mean, all sorts of aviation, then you have to accept the foundation. If you don't do that, then we won't have those things happen. So yeah, they would like Tsai to accept that status quo. Uh, they're not trying, but they aren't, uh, so far as I can see, trying to promote, for example, near-term unification. They're, I think they're smarter than to think they can achieve that. Anybody over here? I don't want to miss, sir. And then you had a question over here? Okay. Thank you very much for what was a fascinating talk. Uh, I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about this. What I heard in your talk is this tension between Beijing's concern with these identity issues, which as you say are, are trending quite strongly in directions that it does not like. Uh, but then what I heard you say towards the end of your talk was that, or at least how I interpreted it was that, that yeah, sorry, yeah. about how I interpreted what you said at the end of your talk is that Beijing's main leverage is economic at this point, right? Like, yes is economic in that they, you know, if they sort of put pressure on Taiwan's economy in four years, then Tsai might not be elected and she'll have less influence over these identity issues. But I'm curious, like, how, you th how effective you think that lever is and if you think that effectiveness might change as China's economy slows down substantially as it seems to be doing. Yeah, uh, two things. First of all, my own view is that when you look at the trend lines on self-identity as Taiwanese only, I think it means something different from what it meant in years past. Uh, in years past, Taiwanese identity was anti-mainlander, not anti-mainland, anti-mainlander identity, right? This is where the uh, opposition came from, this group. So for somebody living in Taiwan, you know, I was born here, my wife was born here, my kids are growing up here, I'm not French, you know, what am I? So I think Taiwanese identity has come more to be sort of a, a natural thing. It is certainly not, however, identifying as part of the mainland, okay? Will economic leverage work? Uh, certainly the PRC hopes, but that is not, they're not totally depending on that. I mean, when you get them to talk in their tough mode, they say what I just said, that, you know, economics, even cultural attraction, political force, and, by the way, military, uh, you know, will cause people in Taiwan to come to understand what reality is. I'm not sure they actually really believe that that's the way things are going to go. Their policy is peaceful reunification. And it is not a short-term policy. It is a very long-term policy. Uh, and I don't think they, why, why would they want a war over Taiwan? Even if they won a war over Taiwan, just to exclude all the possibilities, what would they have? They have a rebellious population, now 23 million, whatever. Uh, yeah, they don't need that. I mean, one of the questions I ponder, and I, I should force Evan to talk about it, what do they really want? What does unification really mean? And I don't have an answer to that. You know, they want one China. Uh, they don't want Taiwan represented as a diplomatic separate entity. Uh, but I believe that at the end of the day, they can find a way to reach one China. But they've all got to rethink what it means. What does sovereignty mean? What does one China mean? What does unification mean? And they're nowhere near 
that kind of thinking. So I think that, you know, just one final point. In, in the, I mentioned this to Evan before. In the Chen Shui Bian administration, for 24 hours, they threatened Taiwan firms invested in the mainland. If you don't you know, oppose Chen, you know, we're going to cause you a lot of problems. 24 hours later, they reversed that policy, except for one company where the guy was blatantly saying, I'm going to take my earnings and support Chen Shui Bian. That was a little more than they could tolerate. But they want to protect their relationship with the companies, with private interests, with the farmers and the fishermen and, and so on. And particularly, as I mentioned, with the youth. And so being too bloody minded, using leverage too blatantly is not going to serve that interest. So they, they, have a, they have a challenge, right? Because they want to put pressure on Tsai. They want the people in Taiwan to put pressure on Tsai, but they don't want to alienate the people in Taiwan at the same time. I mean, that's the best I can do with that. There was a question here. I'll come back to you in a second. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the student movement or the populist movement in Taiwan, like the sunflower movement, will affect the future political situation in Taiwan? That's an important question. It's one I don't really have a good answer for. Um, I was talking to somebody who's now in the political world who was one of the sunflower people, and I asked him, uh, if the KMT, Mr. Zhang, had not tried to slip the, the uh, services trade agreement under the door, would there have been a sunflower movement? He said no. So, okay, it spawned some activity and a lot of youth activity in the election, very important to, to Tsai, I would argue. Uh, but what it's gonna do fundamentally in Taiwan's political structure? I don't know. I think that remains an open question. Uh, and we'll see. No. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, when, when Chen Shui-bian was getting a lot of momentum uh, back in the... A lot of... Momentum yeah. uh, a few years ago, um, and he was about to get elected, um, was there a um, U.S. intervention in terms of uh, pressuring the, their, the Chen Shui-bian's kind of um, group of people about being less um, provocative or um, less, I don't know, um, yeah, provocative. Yeah. And, and also, um, do you think, this is sort of unrelated, uh, do you think that the Xi Jinping regime has uh, an active goal of promoting, like, um, promoting democracy within the uh, PRC, or do, you, do you, are they just like um, trying to make things work, which involves um, pr uh, promoting some kind, some degree of democracy? Um, okay. Yeah. On Chen Shui-bian, first of all. He wasn't gaining momentum. He was a surprise victor, right? Because there were three candidates, and he won with, what was it, 39%, something like that, of the vote. So he, they weren't ready. Uh, at the same time, your point is important, and the US certainly let Chun know that the US was not going to sit by, as the, as the Chinese phrase, sit idly by if somebody was, after, was promoting Taiwan independence, which would have been a direct challenge to U.S. vital national interests. Uh, and he toned it down. Now, some of my colleagues who were working with Taiwan, with him more closely than I was at that period, say that they think he was actually open to a lot of suggestions and that the mainland refused to do, to, to, to reciprocate or to respond appropriately. I reserve on that. I mean, there were a lot of things going on. He did seem to, at one point actually, in June uh, of 2000, there was an Asia Foundation group which went to Taipei and met with him. And he basically said, yeah, we can find a way to live with the 92 consensus. And the next day, one of the things the PRC cites is that Tsai Ing-wen, who I think at that time, was she still an advisor or to the NSC or was she Mac head? I don't remember. She came out and said what the president really meant to say is no. Right? So they hold that, they, they look at that about Tsai today, 
And that, that's one of the kinds of things that they say, see what she really believes. Uh, but yes, an effort was made to make clear that ta moving toward Taiwan independence was going to cause problems with us. And in various ways throughout Chun's tenure, the US stood up and basically opposed him. And at the very end, there was a referendum, you may remember, to join the UN in the name of Taiwan. And the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for that area gave a speech in Annapolis in which, while he also said there, should, there is no excuse for the PRC to use force against Taiwan, directly opposed this referendum. So the US, when its national interest is threatened, is willing to make clear it will intervene. You know, it did this in 1996, I guess, with the, uh, the lobbying of the shells uh, off the northern and southern tips of Taiwan, dispatched two aircraft carrier groups to the area, a warning to the PRC. So you had all sorts of, the US is going to intervene when its national interest is threatened by one side or the other. Otherwise, it's going to try to stay hands off. Uh, Xi Jinping, the only democratization that I'm aware of they've really talked about is a little bit within the party, which I think they could use. Uh, given the current crackdown, I don't sense tolerance for much of anything that isn't orthodox at this point, uh, which is a shame, but I think it's where they are. Sir. This gentleman. Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, you talked about Taiwan's young generation's deteriorating, a deteriorating perception toward one China policy. And at the same time, you talked about the bad economy, which, was, which is the most important concern to the young generations, right. the same young generations. And I don't see any better sources of economic growth um, better than China to the young generations mm -hmm. and to the Chinese, China, Taiwanese government too. And then with this kind of uh, correlations with the econ economic problems in Taiwan, to what extent this young generation's anti-one China pol uh, sentiment can persist? Uh, I think it can persist a long time. They certainly want to take advantage of economic opportunities in the mainland. Right? And they have done that in large numbers, in part because at one time, I don't know if this is still true, the mainland was paying the same number in renminbi as in Taibi, which is a huge increase in salary uh, for those who participated in that program. No, I, I think they're perfectly capable of holding those two ideas at the same time. I'm going to take advantage of any economic opportunity, uh, but I have no interest in unification. And if you look at the polls about attitudes, toward the mainland and about perceptions of mainland attitudes towards Taiwan, they're very negative, right? And as I say, particularly among young people. So your question is, a, is an important one, but I think it is answerable in the sense that they're quite capable of separating these two. Now, the mainland hopes that, in fact, eventually these things will meld. They will see the opportunities. They will see the mainland is not the big, bad mainland. They can do things together. Not, not for unification anytime soon, but they can live together better and, and so on and so forth. We'll see how that works out. Keep in mind, unemployment among, what, 19 to 24 year olds in Taiwan is something like 12 to 13 percent. Interestingly to me, and maybe somebody here can explain it, unemployment among 25 to 30 year olds is like 6 percent, half of it. So at some point along the way, somebody's getting jobs. Uh, and there are a lot of complaints that university graduates aren't getting jobs, and yet when you look at the job unemployment rate for university graduates, it's like 4% or something. So there are a lot of apparent contradictions, uh, but I think the, you know, the mainland hope is that what the contradiction that you are citing as a potential, will people will realize and they will change their view. Right now, that I, I don't see it happening. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering how you foresee an, the increasing Chinese activity in the, in the South China Sea with the uh, territorial claims as well as uh, a growing naval presence changing, if at all, the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, both because of the way it maybe undermines Taiwan's relative position in the region and because of the way it draws the U.S. into perhaps more 
uh, direct involvement than it's traditionally felt comfortable in, in the general area? Yeah, big question, a lot of factors. Um, I don't, th basically the PRC attitude toward Taiwan's position, at least as expressed so far, uh, is that all Chinese uh, are protecting Chinese sovereign interests in the South China Sea. And, and keep in mind this so-called nine dash line goes around, or for Taiwan it's the 11 dash line. For the mainland it's actually now a 10 dash line again. Um, was drawn on a Republic of China map in 1947, which actually came from some cartographer in the 30s or the 20s or something like that. Taiwan and the mainland are not cooperating on South China Sea issues, but their claims are the same, which is they claim all land in the South China Sea. Now, do they, what do they claim in terms of maritime space? That's really the more difficult issue, and the mainland with the nine dash line has refused to be very specific about it. Taiwan has not really addressed it, okay? If, two, two basic comments, one, if a Tsai Ing-wen administration were, as some rumors have it, to give up claims in the South China Sea, except for maybe Taiping Dao, which is the one island that they have some uh, people stationed on, Coast Guard, that would lead the mainland to have a very negative reaction toward the Tsai administration, giving up China's claim, okay? Uh, she's not gonna do that. There's no way She's going to do that. Is she going to be specific? And what if the Philippine case, which is now pending in the, the Hague, if Philippine, if the, if the court decides something against uh, China uh, and for the Philippines, is Taiwan one going to take a position? I don't think so. I think her position is going to be, we're not changing our claims, and on any specific court issue, we're not a party to that, so we don't have to comment. Okay. The other comment I would make, however, is that in the United States, and this is a point I've tried to make to some PRC colleagues, if the mainland is being nasty to Taiwan, at the same time they are behaving in a way which is perceived, and we can, you know, a big subject about their claims and what their behavior is like and so on, but is perceived certainly as being assertive and disturbing in the South China Sea at the same time, I think this will feed on itself and create, will contribute to an even more negative political attitude in the United States toward the PRC. Uh, so PRC officials come to the US or talk, meet with Americans in China, and they say, you should persuade the DPP to accept one China because otherwise there could be problems in cross-strait relations, and that could cause a problem between the United States and China. And my response is what I just said. You need to think about the other side of this. If you've got a problem with Taiwan at the same time, and Taiwan is seeming to act reasonable, not doing everything you want, not, not, not repeating the mantra that Xi Jinping wants Tsai to repeat about one China and oppose Taiwan independence, but basically has got the substance of that. At the same time, you're behaving in ways which seem disruptive in the South China Sea. You need to think, you Chinese need to think about the impact on China. You, U.S. relations, and think about what that means for your policy. So it's all very complicated, but um, there can be a nexus between the two if people are not careful. We have about 10 more minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, when we were talking about maintaining the status quo on across the strait, whether it's from the mainland Chinese point of view or from Tsai's point of view, uh, aren't we forgetting that Time is in Taiwan's favor, more specifically in the DPP's favor, because as time goes on, more and more young people are going to acknowledge their Taiwanese identity over their Chinese identity, and at least that's what the trends are showing. Um, isn't time on their side, and wouldn't China or mainland China have an incentive, a very strong incentive, to be more proactive in reaching out to Taiwan and trying to attract their young people? And you've mentioned that there are job opportunities and they've matched the currency exchange and so on to grant them the, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the carrot side of, of incentives to the young people. And they're not buying that. Opinions of, on mainland China from the young people in Taiwan are still as negative as ever. So isn't there a danger, therefore, that the Chinese are going to try the, the stick and not the carrot 
that they're going to be proactive, not in, a, in an enticing way, but in a coercive well, way? First of all, they, I, I think their view is exactly what you're talking about. I think they are reaching out. They're trying very hard. They want to reach out. Uh, you know, they've got this uh, uh, Sanjong Yiching, the, the three middles, the uh, middle part of Taiwan, the middle entrepreneurs, and uh, I remember the other one, middle class, and the youth. And they've got a policy to try to reach out, indeed, to attract them. Um, I, don't, I don't think, and I don't think they think, that trying to punish the people in Taiwan, as opposed to the government, is a winning strategy. Quite the opposite. They want to attract them. Again, not to unification in any foreseeable time frame, but first of all, to have a better attitude. And second, I think Xi Jinping personally has been pushing on this question of one China. I think he really wants um, the two sides to kind of come together, as they have, that they have really, with a lot of public support under Ma Ying-jeou. It isn't that they support unification, but they've accepted Ma's definition of the 92 consensus, one China respective interpretations. Ma's respective interpretation is the Republic of China. Right? So when you say time is on Taiwan's side, to do what? I mean, it may be against the PRC, may make things more difficult for the PRC, but there, forgive me, I think there's like zero to minus 70 chance that you're going to get Taiwan independence. Ain't going to happen, right? Whether you'll get unification eventually and how that will look and all that, that's, that's, a, that's a future issue. So I think what they need to do is precisely what you suggest. They need to reach out. I don't think they need to apply the stick to the people. They may well think they need to apply the stick to the administration. The danger for the PRC with that is that I think the reaction in Taiwan is likely to be against the mainland. You just took five diplomatic partners. Is that saying one's fault? She's trying to be reasonable. She's trying to say she's not going to upset the apple cart. She's not going to be provocative. She's going to use the outcome since more than 20 years. She's going to accept the existing political foundation. She used that phrase in the, in the Liberty Times interview. And so on, the existing constitutional order. All of those things. And we're supposed to blame her uh, for your having just stolen five diplomatic partners? I don't think so. So they've got a dilemma as to how they handle this. Their response when you point this out is, as I said, you know, uh, well, we're ready for all contingencies and the people in Taiwan will come to face reality. I, I can't do better than that. I, you know, it's, it's what, what it is. Okay, right here. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, <clears throat> we had a speaker a month ago talking about um, Chinese youth and their growing tendency to oppose the government and to be more sympathetic towards democratic practices and democracy. In the mainland. In the mainland. Do you think that this will potentially pose a problem to the Chinese government, its own youth being opposed to its own practices and being sympathetic with Taiwan? and being sympathetic with Taiwan. Uh, some people may want to use Taiwan to make a point, but I think the basic issue is what happens for people in the mainland is what happens in the mainland. And in fact, an interesting point is that there's, there's a scholar in Shanghai who's been arguing for a long time. He's supposed to Taiwan independence, but he basically says our ability to manage Taiwan in the future depends on how we do in the mainland for ourselves. Xi Jinping recently said the same thing. So as far as Taiwan is concerned, I think you know, trying to make the mainland a more attractive uh, family member, which is the phrase they, you know, they like to say we're all part of one family, uh, is part of that. Will, will the mainland have a problem with pressures for more democracy or for democracy of any sort? I think eventually they could. Uh, but right now, it seems like a tight little ship. And I don't know how it's going to go. You know, when you've got letters out there being published pretty broadly calling for Xi Jinping to step down, uh, you've got to wonder about the kind of political forces that are at work. I'm not too worried right now about regime stability. Um, but if I were Xi Jinping, um, I'd have to try and sit down and figure out 
you know, you've got an anti-corruption movement, you've got an economic reform movement, you've got all sorts of things. You've got a huge agenda of very difficult issues which are going to really uh, trot all over a lot of vested interests. And how are you going to manage that? Uh, and one thing on Taiwan you could say as well, so he doesn't need a Taiwan problem. If they're not going to independence, why create a problem in cross-strait relations? Uh, I think that misses two things. First of all, they can graduate whatever they do, measure it in a proportionate response. They don't have to do everything to Taiwan to create a problem. But also, it's a sovereignty issue. And that is a very deep cutting issue. It's like the South China Sea in a way. You know, there's no way that China is going to abandon its claim to pieces of turf, set aside the maritime issue, but pieces of turf in the islands, reefs, whatever it is, in the South China Sea. So uh, I don't see them uh, making a compromise on that. But anyway, I'm not an expert on Taiwan domestic politics, excuse me, PRC domestic politics, but I think they've got some very big challenges in front of them. And there are people who want democracy, obviously. Uh, maybe not much opportunity right now, um, but I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about how to shape the future when the opportunity presents itself. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you.